Can you hear me? Everyone can hear? Wonderful. Hello to everyone. I, uh, I want to make sure that everyone can see us because, oh, there we go. Okay. We've got a large crowd, John. It just went from zero, zero to um, 1,106 people. I was wondering where everyone was. So <laughs> yeah. we're in business. We're in business. Okay. Thank you everyone for being here. We dropped this week a large bombshell about uh, Audrey Baratero, a witness at uh, a witness in court at the Lori Vallow Daybell trial. And why don't we just play that right now? Because we have Dr. John Mathias here with us tonight. Yes, for those new to the station or the station. I used to work at a station for those new to the channel. <laughs> um, uh, for those new to the channel, he is my husband, but he is also a clinical and forensic psychologist and brilliant, I might add. So we're going to have him talk to us about what this means for this case that is um, unending. Lori has had one trial, but there is another one in Arizona as well as Chad's trial next year in Idaho. So let's listen really quickly to that bombshell and we'll go from there. I've verified this person and how they are connected to Audrey, who I can say they, they spoke to. So, um, that they, that they, that they would have, it would have made sense that they, they talked. So I'm going to read it because there are many things this confidential source told me, and I'm only allowed to say this part. So I'm, I'm going to read it to make sure I have it right. So a confidential source, again, that I have vetted, this confidential source spoke directly to Audrey. And this source tells me that Audrey told them that Lori told her, told Audrey, Lori told Audrey, that Lori said to Audrey that Lori watched Joe Ryan take his last breath and that Lori enjoyed it. Lori implied someone else was there when Joe took his last breath and that Lori was grateful Joe's body was not found for days. That's all I can share right now. Um, John, any thoughts right now, or should I keep going? Uh, yeah, um, you know, it was, it is, to me, it's a bombshell for a lot of reasons, but we'll, we'll discuss that in more depth. Did you, <clears throat> did you want to clarify that the, so this is tied into Audrey speaking at the trial and mentioning that, that Lori had said something to her about witnessing someone else dying. Correct. Do you want me to play that really quickly? Sure. Yeah. So the, the source did not bring this up. I went back. I was, I was there at the trial uh, when Audrey stated something that would make me think that this is quite accurate. Um, that, that what I mean, not that this is accurate, but that, the source is accurate, that this makes sense. It, it fits together. It's a puzzle piece. So let me, um, yeah, let me find that. Did she ever say, I killed my kids and I'm going to kill you too? Objection beyond the scope. Overruled. No, I knew nothing about her children. Right. She Did she killed. say, I killed Charles and I'll kill you too? She didn't talk about Charles. Nothing like that, right? She brought up being at the scene, watching someone take their last breaths. And you have previously testified under. There you go. Yeah, so that it's it's a it's a brief moment, but now that moment seems like it could be really important. She mentioned being at the scene when someone took their last breath. And now, according to our source, that was the last breath of Joe Ryan, which places potentially, and again, I, I, we should point out that Lori Daybell is not, maybe not exactly the best, the most honest or accurate reporter of history. So so there, there is that issue here, for sure. Yeah, Lori, yeah, Lori Vallow. 
uh, declares that she has seen Jesus Christ in a vision, that she was married to Moroni, that she saw angels, and uh, she claims in her sentencing speech that she had a near-death experience no one's heard of and that J.G. and Tylee were not murdered. So you're right. We have to take that into consideration. In addition to the fact that Judge Boyce pointed out, Judge Boyce mentioned publicly one of her diagnoses was delusional disorder, and she seems to be highly suggestible and fantasy prone, and I could go on and on about mental health issues, but all of that would would lead someone, you know, potentially to question her credibility and to question her accuracy and honesty. But on the other hand, and let's oh, go ahead. But on the other hand, on the other hand, Lori is quite literal and she seems more than capable of recounting a scene or uh, uh, having the ability to recollect something as traumatic as, as that, as, Joe Ryan's last breath. So yeah. And and just to clarify, Audrey, you know, as people have pointed out, people have been speculating about Joe Ryan for, for four years since his case broke because he did die in 2018 and Lori did not like him. A recording has come out that was recorded at a, a religious meeting at a home a few months after his death. And they stated, or Lori stated then, that she had thought about wanting to murder him. She said she chose the temple instead, but but it was enough that that you know um, Phoenix police reopened the case. Let let but let's share one other person just to say that you know it's it's time to talk about this. So she didn't tell you this, but she told she, she didn't here. say it to me, okay. but she told. April Raymond and Angeline Hall that. And do you know when she, about when she made those statements? No, Angeline and I talked when all of this started happening. Okay. Neither of them live on Kauai anymore, so I don't, I don't see them anymore okay. but Angeline reached out to me when everything happened and she's actually given like she one of these uh anyway she talked to radar online or something I don't know oh, okay but she said to me that Lori had said that she paid Alex to kill Joe okay and so later when April and I were talking I said Angeline said this can you believe it and April said she said the same thing to me okay Lori would kind of say crazy things sometimes uh, anything in particular? I mean, no, nothing like that. Oh, nothing like that. I mean, she never said anything like that to me. Okay. But I'm just saying that's why someone could hear something like that and kind of be like, whatever, Lori. Okay. <laughs> Do you know but, what kind of relationship um, that she had with Joe? I mean, I know a lot of the back history. I really her. don't know that much. I mean, when she moved here... Tylee was still living with Joe, and then Tylee came over, I think, a few months later and then stayed. She, I know she hated Joe, and she didn't like Joe, and she was happy when he died. Uh -huh. um, she was happy Tylee was getting Social Security for it. Uh -huh. um, so I, I want to point out some important things there. And... Anne, her friend from Hawaii, Anne is the one that picked Lori up when she left Charles and JJ for 50 days. Um, she picked her, up, picked her up at the Kauai airport. But Anne states, let's make it clear that Lori didn't say this to Anne. Anne heard that Lori said this to two other friends of, of Lori's, and she's reporting that. But she also gives us a motive there, too. Um, Lori really, really, really hates Joe Ryan. And there was social security money that was received from Joe's death. And that also came up in court. So, so right. That lays, that lays a motive. This is important to talk about then. I just wanted to point that out too. Right. That Joe left money to Tylee. And when Tylee was murdered, that money was then that Lori then 
started taking that money. She was receiving that money. It's part of her grand theft charges. So here you have, you have multiple sources essentially saying the same thing that Lori was present when Joe Ryan died and potentially that Alex Cox was in the room as well. So, I mean, well, (laughs) yeah, she states Alex Cox. I will say, um, Audrey did not state Alex to our source and I have, you know, so we don't know, but right. She, she states that it's possibly Alex there. Yeah. And so, so why is this important? I mean, does it matter? Let's, let's ask that. I mean, first of all, I guess from a pragmatic standpoint, so let, let's assume, let's go with the assumption that Lori is giving us a version of the truth there and that she's in the room and that she had played a role either directly or as a co-conspirator in the death coast conspirator co-conspirator in Joe Ryan's death. Um, Why does it matter? Well, it, it, one reason it matters is because John Pryor filed a motion stating that, and this was on November 9th, essentially uh, trying to get the state to limit their arguments to, quote, their core theory of the case, which they provided, according to Pryor, in Lori's trial. So it matters in the sense that if this is true or remotely true or it's something the defense could use or Pryor can use, then I could see the defense making the argument that Lori's murderous spree begins before Chad Daybell and that Lori continued that spree or she continued those murders with Chad Daybell. So it was really just an extension of Lori's personality and behaviors that she had exhibited prior to meeting Chad Daybell. So she meets Chad Daybell in October, late October of 2018 Joe Ryan dies or his body is found in April, early April, April. I think it's April 2nd, 2018, although his body isn't found for a few weeks. So presumably if there was a murder here, it would have occurred in March of 2018. She gives the murderer's heart speech roughly in, when was it? It was in 2018, right? July, August? It was October October, October 2018 was okay. um, the speech that she gave at Melanie Gibbs home. And she was, I, I want to point this out about Lori too. It actually gives, I think, Audrey some credibility that Lori has just met these people. She has just met Melanie Gibbs. She was at Melanie Gibbs home. Thor was there and a few others. And Melanie Gibbs was actually introducing Lori to friends when she states, I, you know, I, I did not have a murderous heart, but I was either going to I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but she was either going to uh, murder her ex-husband, Joe Ryan, like Nephi, like the scriptures, to keep him from coming after her and her children, or she was going to go to the temple. To put it in perspective, she hardly knew these people, and she's stating this, uh, which would imply that Lori uh, does share odd things with people. She didn't necessarily say that she did it. She said... I wanted to, but I chose to go to the temple instead. But, but uh, I mean, to even confess that in front of new friends is very uh, odd. But so it, let's get back to let's let's assume that this is accurate. It, it gives the defense, I think, some ammunition to argue that Lori really instigated. The murders that Lori. Well, let me let me let me use Pryor's motion. So this is this, this is, is this, from, this month. This month. This is from a few uh, last week, or well, what is today? <laughs> so it's yeah. a, a little over a week ago. This is from November 9th. Uh, Pryor, who's Chad Daybell's attorney, uh, filed a motion to limit the uh, state to consistent arguments. So here's what. Um, here's what. What here's let me just read some of this. So this is from page two. During the trial of Miss Val, quote, during the trial of Miss Vallow, the state argued repeatedly and consistently 
that the alleged conspiracy was set in motion by Lori Vallow and, quote, was driven by Lori's desire for and use of money, power, and sex. Let me read a little more. The same page two, next paragraph. Quote, the core of the state's case was that Lori set a conspiracy in motion, that she manipulated Chad and Alex to partake in that conspiracy, and that she was in charge throughout her plan. So they're arguing that Lori is largely responsible and that the state has an obligation to stick to that core theory uh, that they supposedly developed in Lori's trial. We'll get, we'll get to that issue of whether that's really what the state did, but, but this, this disclosure, I think, really has the potential to amplify that argument that you know, sure. there's, there's another part of this what you just read. And I'm not sure, by the way, so I'm not sure how much of this would hold up in court. A lot of this is speculative and hearsay and secondhand. And so I'm not sure any of this would hold up in court. Well, well, with that, I want to point out, Lolo's asking, did Judge Boyce rule that Joe's death could be brought up at her trial? It wasn't mentioned at all. I think there might be a reason yeah. that Audrey did not say Joe's name, right? Because- right. Because it's true, Joe, there is no open investigation into Joe's death. Joe's death has actually twice been ruled natural causes. I can't imagine that they would be allowed to bring it up. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, John. Yeah, you'd have to, in order to open up a a criminal case with Joe Ryan, I think you'd have to get a lot more evidence and it would require a lot of investigation. And without a body to exhume, it becomes a lot more difficult. So... But assuming that, I, you know, I, I mean, and even if, if you could place Alex in the room, you have a problem there too, because Alex is deceased as well. So if you could somehow, if you could place somebody who was living in that room and witnessed Joe's final breaths, to quote Lori, or to quote our, our source, then I think you'd have a, a better chance to open a criminal case. But, you know, it, I think it would be really difficult at this point to probably get that entered in any way. But, but just from our standpoint, just from you know, thinking about this case for years and sort of knowing the details of this case, it, it raises, it brings up this question again. One of the questions you and I get all the time is essentially was Lori a black widow who yes. began this process of, of murdering with Joe Ryan and then just continued it with Chad and, you know, did Chad go along for the ride, which is consistent with what Pryor is trying to do here in his motion. The yeah, other and reason, this, this, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. The other reason this motion is really important is because Pryor is giving us a glimpse of his defense, of Chad's defense. So we've we've always speculated for since we started talking about this case that the easiest defense strategy for Chad would be to throw Lori under the bus or vice versa. We, we now know that Lori obviously didn't do that with Chad, but it seems highly probable, especially since the children, since Chad's children gave that interview to 2020, a couple of years ago, where Emma essentially said that Chad was framed. That's the term she used, that Emma said that Chad was framed by Lori and or Alex or both. And so, so we've kind of, We've been anticipating this type of defense for a while, and now Pryor is is really kind of putting it out there and showing us publicly that this is this is likely going to be the defense that this that Lori. I don't know if he's going to go so far as to say that Lori framed Chad. That's what the children said in their interview, but certainly that Lori, as as he says in this motion, that Lori drove the conspiracy, and that's that's the term he used uses. So very interesting. And and that's a, that's a comment that you and I have been getting for nearly four years too. Oh, Chad's lucky to be alive. Chad was next. (laughs) Right. Lori's a black widow. Lori was the instigator because, because look at Joe Ryan, even though we can never know, you know, there's certainly evidence and speculation there. Um, There is another piece to that statement that I think is really interesting from a psychological standpoint, and that is the piece about 
the source saying that Lori told Audrey that she enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. So, and why is that a critical piece? Because it points. So we, we began talking about this towards the end of the trial when there were texts that the, the prosecution revealed in evidence. There were texts saying essentially that Lori, the, she didn't use the term enjoyed, but that Lori wanted the children to suffer and she wanted the children to experience pain. Her own kids, when her kids were being murdered, she said in text messages to Chad that she wanted them to experience pain. And so here you see this theme come up again where she's saying that when Joe was dying for whatever reasons, that she enjoyed it. And so you have, here's this, here's this sub motif of sadism or kind of there's this sadistic component here that is indicative of possibly deeper psychopathology. And so, you know, when I, when I hear this type of sadistic component in terms of when I'm interviewing a a criminal, for example, I'm starting to, I'm starting to think about the possibility of antisocial personality disorder or psychopathy or something a little more sinister than narcissism or something a little more problematic in terms of the crimes that have been committed and a lack of empathy and other elements of the crime. So I think that component I think is, is particularly interesting because it might point in the direction of something deeper, like a psychopathic personality or, and again, I'm not diagnosing here, but I'm just trying to, trying to draw some conclusions or inferences from that particular statement, if it's accurate. And from those texts. I want to find those, the texts. I want to find that right now. That actually comes from my live Twitter. John, do you recall who I recently uh, texted those two? Uh, Uh, You were there. No, no. no. Because I could actually pull those up and read them because I do want to point out it was actually Chad saying that he was going to increase the pain threshold. Oh, okay, right. But didn't didn't Lori Lori agreed with them or right? Lori was okay with it, but yeah. it was actually Chad. And I want to make that clear because that's also important to this. Okay. It yeah, was not I, it was not Lori requesting to increase the pain. It was Chad saying, I'm going to increase the pain. And then Lori okay. agreeing to it. And there was like a smiley face. Yeah. So for some reason I thought that Lori said something similar, but it's it's been a while since it's been quite a while since I've looked at those texts, so I'd have to. I should have refreshed. Well, I, I could pull them up, you, but you don't yeah. remember. Okay, I, I. It's from my live tweeting during the trial, and we recently sent them to somebody. But yeah, so I mean, so either way, I mean, but it, it, obviously, if if Lori says it, it's it's, um, it's probably a little more problematic, but just by agreeing, considering these, these are her children, just by agreeing to it, it's, it's obviously an issue. So, but here she's actually saying she enjoyed it. She enjoyed watching Joe die. If in fact she was there and participated in, in his death. So there is this sadistic quality and that type of sadistic quality, for example. So it, it, it might point in the direction of something deeper, something darker, like, uh, that you might see in a psychopath that there, there might be something we've talked about this. There might be something like uh, what's called the dark triad or the dark tetrad. So the dark triad is, it goes beyond psychopathy. It goes, it, the dark triad is a constellation of three variables that um, have been found that kind of go beyond psychopathy and that they're common in criminals or they're especially common in, in mass murderers. And those involve three elements, which are narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism, which Machiavellianism is essentially that you do whatever it takes to reach your goal, that the, the means justify the end. And so it doesn't matter how unethical or, or 
uh, malicious, the means are those means justify the ends no matter what. And that's Machiavellianism. And then there's something called the dark tetrad, which is those three elements plus sadism. So when you add sadism in, you get something even more, <laughs> you know, more malicious and darker and, uh, and I can go even further and, and there's been research showing that if you add paranoia as the fifth variable and then you add a messiah complex, the sixth variable, then you're getting in the terrain of tyrants like Hitler or Stalin or Saddam Hussein, that these, these people with all of these elements, they have no empathy they often engage, they can get engaged in genocide or mass murder. And so I think the more, the more you see these variables in some ways, the more concerning and the more problematic it becomes. And I think, you know, I'm not saying this is true of Lori, but you're, because nobody that assessed her for the trial would have mentioned any of these qualities, but it, it certainly, so there were no diagnoses to this effect. But when you see someone, assuming this is accurate, when you see someone say they enjoyed watching someone die, you know, it re really raises a lot of red flags and concerns. If if I'm assessing someone, if I'm assessing a criminal and they say that they enjoyed committing a criminal act, it's, it's something I'm definitely going to take note of. Yeah. And to those talking about on chat what this is, I, I keep looking for the screenshot so I can show you from my live Twitter. It's actually the pain that Chad was saying that he was bringing up the pain was in reference to Melanie Boudreaux's children. And I believe that they're lucky to be alive. Even Audrey states during her testimony uh, who was dark and who was light. And uh, two of Melanie Boudreaux's children were dark. And that was the reference that you're making. Yeah. So the, the dark triad, which, which then goes to, well, go ahead, go ahead. Right. So, so let's, let's follow this idea. So this, this is the idea basically that prior is, is developing that Lori set this conspiracy in motion that she drove this plot and that she should be held, held, be held accountable and not Chad. So Pryor calls it the common thread. Um, he, Pryor, also filed a couple of, of motions to take the death penalty off the table. Um, I'm going to... For Chad, yeah. Right, for Chad. I'm going, I don't, I don't want to get into too many details in that, but there, he, he continues with a similar argument, by the way that his argument, one of his arguments is that since Lori didn't have the death penalty and she was the, the common thread or the driver or the instigator of this conspiracy, that's the term he uses, then why would Chad be punished so severely when in fact he wasn't the one driving this plot? So, and so he resorts to similar arguments in his motion I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to read some parts of this and we want to talk about it. So these were also filed on November 9th. Um, the particular motion I'm reading from here is 11 pages. It was, it is called the motion to strike the death penalty based on relative culpability on page two. So one thing prior does in this motion is he, he actually uses quotes from the trial to prove his points. And he, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read some of these quotes and I want to talk about them because they're really important. So um, on page two, his, one of his first facts is, is that quote, Lori Valla was the common thread between the murderers and set the alleged conspiracy in motion. And then he backs up that claim, that assertion with different quotes that came out of the trial that the prosecution made. So I'm, I'm going to read a few of those. I don't want, I don't, we're not going to have time to read all of them, but I'm going to read one of them. This is B. This is a quote that, and again, this is said by the prosecution quote. And there's this, the prosecution said at some point during the trial, quote, and there's one common thread through these murders, Lori Vallow. 
She is the one person who ties these all together. That's number B. C, I mean, letter B, letter C. Quote, she's moving this plan forward, meaning Lori. There's no question that Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Dable were murdered. Who is the common thread? Lori Vallow. So he's quoting from transcripts of the trial, and he's obviously pointing the finger at Lori, and he's arguing that for the fact that the prosecution itself implicated Lori as the common thread. Now, but let's let's look a little deeper. So this is an important question. Is Lori Vallow Daybell the common thread? Right? It, I mean, I, I you know, obviously I I can't think of a more important question for Chad's trial and certainly exactly it's, it's critical it's critical in terms of the prosecution's case. So let's look a little more closely at the the B they said, and again, the prosecution said this, that Lori is, quote, the one person who ties these all together, the one person. So there's there's an obvious, so when I read this, I thought there's an obvious problem here with what Pryor's trying to do. And that is, he's missing the point. He's missing the biggest point here, which is the common thread is not a person. The common thread is an idea. The common thread is an ideology. And so when Pryor says she is, quote, she is the one person who ties these all together, maybe so, but she's not the one idea that ties it all together. As far as C, he says, the prosecution says, who is the common thread? Lori Vallow. Again, the question isn't who, the question is what. The common thread is not a person. It's an idea. It's an ideology. And that's where he gets it wrong. The ideology is Chad's. And the ideology comes, it's based upon the system of light and dark. It's based upon the idea of zombies. It's not a person. And so prior, I, you know, I, I, in a way I, I admire his attempt here, but like, so many arguments he's pulling pieces bits and pieces of the prosecution's uh testimony and tr- um um arguments during the trial and using the ones that that fit his argument so this idea that Lori's a common thread false because an idea is the common thread and it's the idea of the new jerusalem and this religious ideology that's driving all the murders the one thing that all these murders have in common with the exception of Joe Ryan, if that's true, is that every single person that was murdered was labeled a zombie, which fits into Chad's belief system, the belief system that Chad developed and that Lori bought into and that drove this case. So Lori's not driving the conspiracy. Maybe she's driving a conspiracy, but she's not driving the conspiracy in the sense that the idea was not hers and it wasn't developed. The ideology here was not developed by her. Thank you. And you know who else agrees with you? Uh, I don't know if she would say she agrees with you, but according to Audrey's testimony, she agrees with you because uh, while she in Audrey's testimony at court dropped a bombshell herself by claiming that Lori threatened her, and told her she was going to pretty much chop her up and put her in a plastic bag and that she watched someone take. Yeah. And now we know that the person that Lori said she watched Joe take her last breath and that she enjoyed it. Um, Audrey also answers questions and refers to Chad would now be a good time to play some of her testimony that I I wanted to, or is that later? Yeah. Let's, let's wait on that. I want to, I just want to run through this. I want to, I want to, I want to dispute some of this motion first because this this motion is really critical and it's going to be argued in a few weeks. So um, I never want to interrupt you. Keep going. Keep going. My, I'll take my, you my, tell me. What to do. My goal is not, I'm not trying to help one side or the other here. I'm just trying to analyze this information. So I should point that out too. I mean, 
some people have said, well, you're, you know, you're, you're really helping the prosecution. I mean, okay, if I am, um, it's because that's, that's where the evidence leads me. So, um, and this is a really interesting argument that Pryor's making. And, and it's, a, you know, potentially, if you think of Lori as this sadistic psychopath who begins her murders with Joe Ryan, then you really, you're going to have to really explain why that's not accurate. So, um, especially given the fact that, you know, th- that that idea really plays into that's, prior. It plays that into what's prior. not accurate. Cause I do think she's a psychopath. Wait. So you said if you know that, 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 that Lori starts this whole process and then continues it through with Chad. In other words, the Chad is just a bit player. Right. Or that, that Chad's next. That's what a lot of people think. Oh, Chad's, Chad's next. Yeah. That's next on the black widow's, li- widow's list or something. Okay. Right. So right. the second in the motion for, to, to rid the, 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 to get, to strike the death penalty. Uh, the second argument, the second assertion that Pryor makes is that Lori value manipulated Alex Cox and Chad Dable to follow her. And he, again, he, this is a quote from the actual trial transcripts quote, Lori manipulated Alex through religion. She manipulated Chad through emotional and sexual control. So that's interesting because, number one, Alex isn't really relevant to, I mean, necessarily relevant to Pryor's defense. So that's not really critical in terms of what he's trying to do here. But um, manipulating Chad through emotional and sexual control, it kind of misses the point in the sense that the area where she did not manipulate Chad was through the system of light and dark, right? So this goes back to the idea that this whole thing is driven by an ideology. And that, so it's interesting. He's arguing that this is, you know, he's trying to show here that Chad was just a follower and that, but, but clearly like saying that Chad was manipulated through emotional and sexual control has nothing to do with Chad's ideology. And again, this kind of undercuts the whole idea that, that, that Lori was running the show, that she set this conspiracy in motion because, okay, yes. Did she manipulate him through emotional and sexual control? Yeah. To some degree, but she did not manipulate his ideas and his system of thought. And that's the most critical point. Here, that, here. That was, that was point, that was point A. Uh, D from the same, from number two, the assertion number two that Lori manipulated Chad quote, Chad's telling Lori what she wants to hear. She reinforces him with sexual behavior. Again, this doesn't prove the point that, that Lori was in control. It only proves the point that yes, she manipulated him with sexual behavior, but again, she doesn't, what she doesn't manipulate Chad's system of thought, Chad's ideology. And that's really what's running this. That's what's driving this whole plot. Yes. So in the third assertion that Pryor thinks proves this, this claim that Lori was in charge throughout is he says, quote, number three, Lori Vallow led the alleged conspiracy throughout one of his one of his p- proofs here, which is D, is, I'll read it, I'll quote it. He says, quote, Lori Vallow is telling Alex Cox what to do. In these messages, you never see Alex tell her what to do. She's telling him what to do. Most of this point about Lori Vallow leading the alleged conspiracy has to do with Alex. That he can't find any evidence here that she somehow led Chad, but I, I don't. So it's interesting because he's trying to make the argument that Chad followed her and he's using Alex Cox to make the point. Did Alex Cox fall, which doesn't do it because clearly Alex following Lori is very different than Chad following Lori. Right. Very Um, different. So the idea that Alex follows Lori has nothing to do with 
her chat following her. He uses another quote here from the trial. He takes it out of context. He says, quote, that, so this is, Melanie Gibbs says, okay, Captain, why does she say, um, why does she say, okay, Captain, because Lori's in charge? And then Ch- what does Chad say? Chad says, quote, <laughs> you'll you probably remember this quote. Chad says, quote, just grab grab me by the storm and I will follow you to the ends of the universe. So Pryor says, not you will follow me, Lori, but I will follow you. I mean, again, this is this is this is not getting to the heart of the matter. This is about the I agree that that Lori can manipulate Chad with sexual, you know, control or or experiences. Absolutely. But that that's quite different than Chad following her ideas and following her lead in the on, in going to the New Jerusalem and the system of light and dark, right? So anyway, so I think there's it. Pryor's making an interesting argument, but it, it doesn't really fit the evidence and the prosecution and the prosecution's favor. They haven't had a chance to make that argument because Lori did not develop the ideas that drove these murders or that she did not develop the ideology that drove these murders. And to speak to the point about Joe Ryan, the motives were quite different. So the motives for the murders with Chad Daybell were that she saw Chad as a God or a deity and she wanted to follow him. And she believed she'd be the goddess that went with him to the new Jerusalem with Joe Ryan. It was quite different. The mo, if in fact, Lori had something to do with his murder. The motive there would have been to, as she said in the in the murderer's heart testimony in front of a group of people, it would have been to eliminate her pain. That she suffered a lot because of Joe Ryan, because he contested custody, because she believed that Joe Ryan had molested her children, and she simply wanted to and and the and the money component and the money. She wanted to eliminate Joe for those reasons, which were very different. I mean, there's some overlap that in some, you know, was, was money involved in the Daybell case? Yes, it was. Yes. Custody? No. But so the, the, the motives were quite different. If she's, if she's murdering Joe Ryan, you have to see that, or I would see that as a very separate motive in a very separate situation. I think that, that you could argue that this idea of the murderous heart might be the same in the sense that she's she still has a murderous heart. <laughs> she has a murder. Right. She's, she's, she apparently, that's where we are. Yeah. She apparently has no empathy and remorse and has no problem murdering people consistently, but the motives change. So if she's murdering, if she supposedly murders Joe Ryan and then she murders Charles. So an example of this would be Charles Vallow, who's the first person murdered in this string of events in the Daybell case, Charles is identified as a zombie. Charles is referred to as as somebody called Ned Snyder and Ned Snyder is not Charles. And so Charles has to be murdered to eliminate this dark entity known as Ned Snyder and who was a zombie. So the, the motive is quite different at no time was Joe Ryan labeled a dark spirit or a zombie because Chad Daybell wasn't around at that time. Correct. Joe Ryan was simply a hindrance to the life that Lori wanted. And he had some money and he had created a lot of pain and he tried to obstruct custody and she didn't like that. So she was an obstacle. It's a very different motive. Charles was never an obstacle. He was an obstacle. And once she met Chad, he was, he was an obstacle to her relationship with Chad. But the motive was completely different. And so in that sense, you could argue, I think somebody could argue that the murderous heart theme continues, that this is someone clearly who seems to have a somewhat sadistic component and she doesn't show a lot of remorse or empathy. And those elements would all play into continuing to, to enact the same behaviors later. But they're very different in terms of the motives are very different in terms of how they play out. Well said. So in other words, 
if Joe Ryan was murdered by Lori, it speaks to her character and how she has a murderous heart and how she might be capable of doing the things and even show some sadistic qualities if indeed she said she enjoyed watching him take his last breath. But if she still, said that, right, if she said that, that's really damning. That's really, that's that's a really... About who she is. About, right, it's a, it's a, yes, it's a reflection of a really sadistic quality that if any human being enjoys, enjoys, and that's a term apparently she used, watching another person die, then... That's atypical. Right. But it still doesn't speak to the belief system and the reasons for the string of murders, including her own children in 2019. Right. Ago. Exactly. So the, the, the motives change. So once you go from Joe Ryan to Charles Vallow, the, the, the MO changes, the motives change, everything changes except for the fact, arguably, that Lori still has this lack of empathy. She has a sadistic component. She has all these components that, so, so typically a normal human being might say, no, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you murder my husband. I'm just going to divorce him. Why do we need to go through this whole charade of murdering him when I can just divorce him and we can be together that way? Right. That's that, that would be a normal rational <laughs> response to, a relationship that's going to end or it's failing or whatever is going on with Charles. Right. And so, and so somebody like Lori, if in fact she did participate in Joe's murder or death would be more likely to go along with a murderous plot. And so if, if when Chad sells her on the fact that Charles is a zombie, then she, you know, she's more likely to buy into it. She's already been there. Yeah. And I, and I want to point something out about the, the black widow narrative that isn't, it, it's not hitting home for me. The fact that like, Oh, Chad was next her. She's, she's now been married five times. Her first two husbands are still alive. Right. Um, she has really only actually, people talk about how she hated um, all of her husbands actually, despite some controversial things in, in the relationships and being very quick relationships and, rumors about them being abusive and, and all this stuff. There was really only one husband that she continually ex-husband that she continually talked about um, disliking or hating or loathing. And that's Joe Ryan. Yeah. And um, so if that was part of his demise, you know, and then she kills Charles or Alex kills Charles while in this belief system with Chad and Chad is now still alive. So, so I actually also want to argue this idea that Lori, that Lori is a black widow. I, I don't quite see, I don't think that's a psychological term. So I can't really tell you uh, <laughs> if she is or isn't, we can't, we, we can't go find a black widow in, in um, a book on psychology and decide if she is or isn't. But as far as my personal definition of it, I don't, I don't see that pattern with her quite yet. I, I think it's, it's more of a true crime term and maybe a Hollywood term. So you, you see that. Well, there you go. That's why I'm talking about it. That's, this is my specialty. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, with all the soap operas I've watched, no, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. I actually never really watched a lot of soap operas, but you know, we'll say, um, in my opinion, I just, I just, that pat, I'm just not seeing that black widow pattern in her. So thus I don't see that Chad's life was in danger ever. And, and you could, and let's, so, and let's, let's dig a little deeper into these motions and into this idea that Lori could have been the main culprit or instigator that, it, it, you know, some people have, have questioned me and said, well, Chad wasn't really violent. You know, Chad, why would Chad, why, how could Chad be the instigator if he has no history of violence and, Lori does. I mean, actually, Lori really doesn't up until this situation, at, at least not a formal criminal history. So there, there, there's some speculation about some, some behaviors that she engaged in when she was younger that would certainly push up against the idea of criminality, but, but she has no formal charges. But so I, I think it's, it's an interesting argument 
in in the sense that Chad appears fairly docile and passive and um right he doesn't seem like someone who could drive a plot like this drive this you know multiple murders and all that kind of stuff so so what's going on there I, so the first thing i think people need to look at is that Chad's books are filled with violence Chad's yeah. books are Chad's books Absolutely. are are, are sense right they're Chad's books are just horrifically violent and people are dying left and right. And, and if you read Chad's books, any of his books, it just, it's he, the way he describes murder and violence is just kind of matter of factly. Mm -hmm. Like there's really, there's no empathy around any of the violence in his books. And when people die, it's, it's just sort of like the process of life. Right. And so yeah, maybe not similar to visions of glory. Visions of Glory, people are dying right and left. In Chad's books, people are dying right and left, which many of them were written before Visions of Glory. I want to point out Chad's books. And so you could you could just argue that, okay, that's all fiction and that's fantasy, except for the fact that Chad later says they're not fiction. And if you want to look, I think if 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 you want to get a better sense of what's on Chad's mind or kind of his mental state or his psyche, it's certainly so I'm trying to, so, so these books would be a reflection of that. The amount of violence in these books, I think would be indicative of kind of the way Chad Daybell perceives the world. So I don't think it's that much of a stretch. Now you might say, well, okay, Stephen King's the same way. Stephen King's books are filled with violence. And you know, why isn't Stephen King a mass murderer? And the answer is because Stephen King never at any point says that his books are, nonfiction later. <laughs> and number two, Stephen King's books are clearly his themes and his characters are clearly very different from Stephen King himself and from the way Stephen King lives his life. Whereas Chad's books are all a version of LDS theology. In Rexburg, Chad Idaho or in Springville. That's where they take place too. So Chad sees his books, and I, I say I say this in some of our initial podcasts when we first started thinking about this case, but Chad and, and Melanie Gibb supports this view, that many of the people that follow Chad, they saw his books as scripture. And so that that's a massive difference. That Stephen King, you, if you take someone like Stephen King or any writer that engages in fantasy fiction, Game of Thrones, right, whatever, that that there's there's clear distinctions between <laughs> between the fiction that they're writing and their characters and their plots and their lives at no point is stephen king going to argue that because he had a near death experience that god was giving him information that he downloaded into his books the carry what or whatever stephen king book you want to take misery or carry or whatever your favorite Stephen King book is it didn't come from, he didn't download it from God. He didn't download it from beyond the veil. Is right. That, you, by the way, both Chad Daybell and Tim Ballard download things. Right. They download yeah. the visions. I'm wondering where they're getting that. Hmm. But, uh, so at no point did Stephen point. King, you know, hook up his USB cord to the heavens and write his books accordingly. But that's, that's what Chad thinks he's doing. So, so in other words, in other words, if if um, if Stephen King decides it comes forward and on Twitter or uh, YouTube live, by the way, my books are real. Let's be concerned. Tell them we're good. <laughs> yeah, although I think from Chad's books, you can kind of articulate a broad kind of ideology, whereas in Stephen King, I think you'd be really hard pressed. <laughs> to come up with a, a larger kind of theological vision of, uh, of the world or the universe or the cosmos. Yeah, it's so, true. I mean, I've read Chad's books too. I mean, his, his characters are named Emma and Leah and Heather and Brad. Those are all in his immediate family. You know, um, his first, his first book is, is called an errand for Emma and Emma is his daughter. So you won't, you won't see Stephen King naming books after his family members or right there. I think they're able, people like Stephen King, authors like Stephen King are much better able to make those 
distinctions and to differentiate between what's fantasy and what's real in their lives. And I mean, that's not to say that great authors don't use their life experience in their work. They do. Well, can we also just point out that Stephen King is a good writer? I mean, if we're doing a comparison. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, one of my favorite books is Stephen King's On Writing which is a book about writing. Yeah, it's and a brilliant Sable book. Sable Johnson says, they actually relate to humanity's way of thinking, plus they make you reflect on a message or lesson that's being told. Yeah, agree. Even The Simpsons, who I think Chad stole a lot of his zombie names from, has a moral and a way of making you think. Chad Davis' books, not so much. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Right, yeah, There's there's a reason why Stephen King has sold millions of books and he's had many of them adapted into movies. Yes. But anyway, yeah, let's not, I think we, we made that point. Um, there's, there's a, let's, I want to go back to, so let's go back to Pryor's motion. And in particular, I'm interested in this motion of, of how the prosecution, because Lori drives this whole conspiracy the prosecution can't deviate from that. They have to stick with this core theory of the case. That there's another, there's a few other arguments, by the way, of why that is, I believe, a bit absurd. And one of them is has to do with Tammy Dabo. So Tammy Dabo obviously complicates this entire argument. Yes. That that you I could actually say because of Tammy and Chad's, you know more prominent involvement in the murder, potential murder. He hasn't been tried yet, but potential murder with Tammy Daybell. The Chad is, is actually more of a common thread than Lori. Lori wasn't in the country or I'm sorry. She was, she was, she was in the country. She was in, she was in Hawaii when Tammy was, was allegedly murdered. Yes. With Audrey hanging out with Audrey and Melanie Boudreau. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so, so Lori, so Lori was convicted for the murder of Tammy Daybell, but as a co-conspirator, co-conspirator, not she wasn't convicted of murder one. And Chad has been charged with murder in the first degree for Tammy, which actually, so this idea that Lori's the common thread becomes really problematic if you look at Tammy's murder. Yes. That Tammy is not a common thread for Tammy's murder would not be a common thread for Lori, but Tammy's murder would be a common thread for Chad. So that's another argument that undermines this motion that at no point does prior try to make distinctions between the different murderers and the, the, the level of involvement of the different players, right? He, he just kind of, he gives us, he gives us sort of this blanket statement that Lori's driving the bus or that Lori's in charge and therefore, that's what the prosecution argued, and they need to stick to it. But at no point is he trying to differentiate the players and the murderers, and, and in particular, the fact that above and beyond any of these murders, the alleged murder of Tammy Daybell has, Ch has Chad's involvement all over it. And so I think that becomes a real problem for this motion or for this argument that the prosecution needs to stick to their core theory because Tammy complicates that. There's another issue too, I think that's important and that, that, that really kind of disputes this idea that this core theory that, that Pryor's trying to argue for. And that is that both Chad and Lori, and I think this, this is important in understanding this case in general, but that Chad and Lori are so closely intertwined that I think in many ways you can't I, – I do think that ideology drives this, but when you put that aside, clearly there's no question that Lori influences Chad. There's no question in my mind that, that Lori, as Pryor points out, that Lori has some emotional and sexual uh, – there's some emotional and sexual manipulation of Chad. I think that's true. And so – to, to say that Lori is really in charge of this, it really it negates the fact that these two are both heavily involved. 
that they're both closely intertwined and it's really hard in many levels. Once you get past Chad's ideology, it's really hard. It is at that point, very difficult to separate them. And that's why they're co-conspirators. And that's why the state wanted to try them together. And I think it would have been much more compelling that in, in many ways, this is, this motion's absurd in the sense that, that the state wanted them to be tried together because then they would have presented the case in the way they wanted. And they, right. And that, that they would, they're, they're, <laughs> they would have presented a different core theory in terms of Chad's ideology and Lori's involvement and how they influ- reciprocal influence. Let's call it that, that there's, they're both influencing each other. They're both driving this murderous plot and there's a reciprocal influence of each on the other. Some people have written me and suggested there, there's maybe some type of folly I do or diagnosis of folly I do, which I don't think is that far off by the way, but, but that speaks to the fact that prior is trying to kind of distort this situation by saying that clearly Lord, the, the prosecution needs to stick to this theme that Lori drove the bus. And of course that's going to be good for Chad, but that's not what the evidence suggests. No, it doesn't. I've never heard you say that about folly. You do. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> I think it's, it's something I keep going back and forth on, but yeah, I, I mean, I think there's an element of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, here, here to everything you said, keep going. I can see as you're flipping pages, keep going. I'm here. No, I'm no, here I'm for just, this. No, this no. Is keep just, going. <laughs> this is Pryor's motion. It. I did. You can see I've redlined a lot of it. So, um, no, I just have some notes about, so I think that's, those are pretty much my, that's my response to this motion and to this idea that prior is trying to develop that the Lori's in charge here and Lori's driving the bus and Lord, we should, you know, chat clearly we should believe prior when, um, or the defense when, when they argue that, that Chad was just a, a little, you know, a poor little victim that was, dragged along by Lori and didn't really want to be involved and had nothing to do with it, which by the way, the, you know, <laughs> one problem with this motion is in some ways it's, it's, it's implicating Chad, right. In the sense that if you say that Lori was in charge, you're still saying that Chad was, Chad was involved. So I, I think, right. That the, there's a there's an implicit idea here that Chad knew and he was involved and that even if Lori's in charge, right, that, that he's culpable. Yes. So I think in order in order to exonerate Chad or in order to get an acquittal, he would have to go so far as to say that Chad knew nothing, that Lori took the reins all by herself that she planned and executed all these murders with Alex. And that was sort of, by the way, what the, the children were implying in their, in their interview with 2020. But the Daybell's Chad, Chad and Tammy Daybell's children. Yes. That they were, they were sort of implying that, that Chad was framed, that Chad didn't know anything about this, that Chad had nothing to do with it. And I don't think that's, so I don't think that's what Pryor is arguing here in this motion. He's simply arguing that Lori was in charge, but Chad seemingly, I mean, he doesn't say this. I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens, but he's implying that Chad kind of knew some of this or Chad went along with it and he was manipulated, but that doesn't mean he didn't know. And so in a way, in a, in a implicit way here, in a covert way, there's almost an admission of guilt here. I think maybe I'm not sure that's what prior intended, but uh, unless he's willing to go so far as to say that Chad was completely blind and ignorant to what was going on and that, that, that Lori did everything. And uh, I don't know, clearly anybody who, who saw the first trial and attended the first trial, I didn't attend, but I, I, I followed it closely through you. Thank you. And um, our discussions would know that, 
that Chad has his his print all over this, you know, this whole situation, this whole scenario. To say the least. Yeah. I actually I actually have I did find some of those tweets um during that I took during trial that that just show how um in together Chad and Lori are and were were and are th that I can read in a little bit. Um, but I also want to say you're not the only one who thought that it read like a confession that Pryor's motion read a little bit like a confession or an admission of guilt. That's interesting. We had a listener say the same thing. Yeah, I mean it, it's 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 subtle, but you know it's it's he's not saying Chad didn't know anything. He's not using that type of language. Maybe he, I think he knows that would be over the top, but he's not using the language that Chad's children used, which was that he was framed, that he knew nothing about what was going on, that Lori did everything. And so, so he's not going that far, but I think he would have to go that far to argue that, that to argue for an acquittal. Yeah. Right. Can I, can I read? Well, let me, let me just share with you. Cause I want you to keep going. Let me just share with you what I want to share tonight. And then okay. you tell me when is a good time to share. I do have some of those tweets. You, you brought up the pain, the, the pain tweets. And, and I, I wanted to go find them because here's the thing with those. Um, those have never, been shared in any um, FOIA documents we've received. These that was right. a bombshell at trial. Yeah, that these tweets came these these texts between Chad and Lori talking about increasing the pain in children was a bombshell at trial. They're not in any documents that we have, and uh, all we have is the audio and, and then the tweets. I was live tweeting, so. I do want to share those because if there's, I just want to point out, like it's something John and I talk about a lot. It was, it was a really hard day in court that day to hear, to hear and see, we had a screen, we could see the text on the screen and then they were relaying and reading what the text said. And I was tweeting them. And if, if there's any question about Chad's role in this, just read those tweets. Just read those tweets. But I also think it's important to explore Audrey's testimony a little bit as well, because this bombshell that we received this week is, is, uh, has to do with Audrey. Let Audrey Ferretero. Go ahead. Let me, let me just finish your thought. So yeah, this, so I just mentioned that, that if Lori says she enjoyed watching Joe die essentially, and, and how that shows a sadistic component, Chad saying that this idea of wanting to inflict pain upon the kids goes back to something that Chad said in his autobiography about killing bees. So I, I know that's might be a little bit of a stretch, but it's, it's an interesting moment in his Chad's autobiography where Chad talks about an incident when he was in middle school, where he essentially started stomping on bees and he killed, I forget the exact number, but he killed a lot of bees and, that's not the important point. The important point is not only did he kill the bees, but he says in the book that he liked it. It's this component right. about, he said he enjoyed it. Right. And so here you have like Lori, potentially here you have this sadistic component to Chad. And I, I think you see that in some of his books where you have genocides in his books and you have this mass violence that doesn't even seem to phase him at all. Well, you have the the first book he wrote. Let's not forget the first book he wrote. It was not an errand for Emma, as you stated. It was the murder of, what was it? Oh, he wrote it in, in third yeah. grade. In right. third grade was his first book. He was very proud of it. Yeah. And it was, it was a, it was a, about a murder. It was a murder. Yeah. He put it in the third grade library. He was very proud. So proud that he wrote about it in his uh, autobiography years later. That's how important this was to him. The murder of yeah, I can't think either. That was his first book. So. Right. A murder for, yeah, I don't remember. Doctor something. I I should. Yeah, we we actually have 
a picture cover. Of the, yeah, the cover. The cover of that book is on one of our podcast covers. Um, yeah. So, so in other words, Chad. Uh, in other words, Lori isn't the only one with a murderous heart. Maybe we should say that. That we can tell. Um. So, so with that, where do you want to go from here, babe? Sh should I? read those tweets? Do you want me to play Audrey's testimony too that also shows a lot of that belief system? I think it's important to explore Audrey's testimony too a little bit more because it was a really important moment at court and there were some really important moments beyond the threat that Lori gave her. Yeah. Why don't we follow up with, with Audrey and then, and then we can take some questions. I think I'm, I pretty much covered my critique of the motion and what it means for the case and this idea of, of Lori kind of running the show. So, okay. So whatever, whatever read? you want to, whatever yeah. you want to follow let's, with. Okay, let's read some of these tweets. You know, what's interesting about me playing these YouTube videos and I'm not sure why John, but, I can't hear, so that's why I'm using the transcription. Actually, I'm following along with the transcription, but I'm okay. I'm I'm unable to hear. So it's I kind of wanted to discuss what Audrey says, but let's let's start with the tweets I pulled. Um, Marcella, thank you so much. Marcella is my trial friend, my crime con friend. Um, Marcella, it's good to see you. We sat by each other in trial for a few days. All right, I just want to share these tweets because. This was live tweeting in trial this spring, sitting in Boise, and and I I, I want it here. This is this is important. If you want to know who Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow are, here you go. Here you go. Um so I hope that's the right, yeah. Okay, so a heart. Okay, let's start this. It actually begins with the storm comment. So first off, they're saying here on May 8th, um, let's make this bigger so we don't have to look at those ads. So this is May 8th. Chad to Lori, I've instructed to focus my efforts on Hillary, and so I will. Hillary is Tylee. Lori to Chad, okay, find out her percentage for me and JJ. And by the way, this is to find out how close to death they are. Chad to Lori. She is at a 0.13. I turned up the pain. They're referring now to Tylee, to Hillary. I turned up the pain to a 10 and placed a spiritual virus on her. This is about Lori's daughter. He is at a 99.99. Raphael visited him. Raphael is Chad and told him to follow Amy into the light. I also assured him that James would love and take care of his mommy. So now we're talking about JJ. So, okay. So Hillary is Tylee. They placed a spiritual virus on her. And now JJ, by the way, he's at a 99.1. Raphael visited him and told him to follow Amy into the light and assured him that James would love and take care of his mommy. James is also Chad, which he will with all of his heart and soul. And Lori's response to us is, Lori to Chad, this is sweet. I miss you desperately. Heart. Heart is the witness on the stand explaining these texts. The closer someone was to zero, the closer they were to death. Chad indicates that Tylee is at a 0.13 and JJ's death percentage is 99.9. .9. Heart then explains that Raphael and James are two names that Chad references for himself. Then it continues. Chad says, you are so adorable, beautiful, heavenly, luscious, angelic. So many divine attributes rolled into one dynamic, desirable package. I want you more desperately than you want me. Oh, so now here he is seeking um, confirmation. Chad to Lori, just grab me by the storm, Chad says, and I will follow you to the ends of the earth, end quote. That's the actual quote that Pryor used in his statement in his motion. And Lori to Chad says, and then what? And Lori to Chad says, back to crying and saying goodbye, back 
to the box, Chad to Lori. This trip to Utah has a lot of finality to it. I was told extreme changes are coming for me and to Utah, and I welcome them both. Lori to Chad, what is Blake's percentage? Blake is Melanie Boudreaux's child, little child. Lori to Chad. Well, he drew, and uh, Lori to Chad explaining why she's asking. Blake drew three crosses on the wall on his bedroom and we just finished painting over them like he was marking it for the dark side to find him. Chad to Lori says, Blake is at a seven. I took my sword of light and I sliced his aura. Chad to Lori, I also decreased Blake's pain tolerance to one and then I greatly increased his pain. His desire to depart is at 80%. It continues. Oh, they're talking about Rhonda. Rhonda's Kay Woodcock. Um, they'll work hard on Rhonda when they're together. I will get her numbers. Lori says, oh, good. Let's work on that hard. And then they agree to go to the temple. And then let's see if there are any more. The, the, it continues. It continues. And then we have the love story. And perhaps that's all we'll see right now. There, there was more of that, but they continued to increase the pain tolerance. And if anybody wants to read more of that, head to May 8th on our, on our Twitter thread, hidden true crime, twitter.com slash hidden true crime. But th there are actually more. I can't find them at the moment. It might've been earlier in that day. Yeah, that was the 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 first component when they were talking about Tylee and JJ and Chad inflicting pain and Lori responding with this is sweet is unbelievable. Yes. Yes. Um, we also did not talk bringing up Raphael. We also did not talk um about the trust level, but it's actually, it's, it's interesting. Let me just pull this up. I discussed this earlier this week, the trust. So Chad Daba, let's point that out. Chad created this, this system of who Lori should trust. I'll share that really quickly. So this is Chandler, the police department and, uh, Chad sent Lori a message on July 30th, 2019 that read that Tammy is at a three and JJ is at a two and both are being heavily shielded to stop intruders, meaning uh, zombies into their body. Um, then Chad sent Lori a similar message providing trust levels to those that she needed to be aware of. Now, um, Melanie Gibb is at 97, Zulem is at 96. This is Chad saying to Lori, this is who you need to trust. Al or Alex is a 94. Thor is at 94, Nicole's 86, Mel B's 85, and it continues. And it jumps down to Summer, Lori's own sister, who's 40, which I find interesting because it feels like he is trying to isolate her and get her to not trust her family because uh, Lori's parents are both almost at zero. But what's the most interesting is um, that bottom line right there on the left. Um, Audrey and Raphael, who we know as Chad, are both 100. They are the people that Lori is supposed to trust the most over Melanie Gibb, over everyone. And I thought it was interesting today, John, when you said that's really important and you told me why it was so important. I agreed with you. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's important for a few reasons. Number one is it, it would explain why Lori would disclose to Audrey Right. Something, right. something so potentially incriminating. Why would Lori tell Audrey that? And it's because Chad deemed that she was a hundred percent trustworthy more so than more so than their closest confidants, Melanie Gibb. And so yeah. that's one thing. The other thing that's interesting about Chad giving Audrey a hundred percent trust rating 
is it shows once again that Chad is the one determining who's trustworthy. Chad's running the show. If Chad is telling people who's trustworthy, then he's the one making that determination. He's in charge. He's leading that. It's not Lori telling telling us who to trust. It's Chad. Yes. Just like Chad is in control of the, apparently in control of the pain meter. He's in control of the light and dark scale. He's in control of designating people as zombies. Again, it's this is Chad. This is this is Chad's show. It is Chad's show. It is. Uh, I want to play a bit of Audrey's testimony. I think it's really important to listen to it. Many people have not heard it. Many okay. people, um, or if they did hear it, they heard it the day of the trial and haven't heard it since. And, and if we want to know uh, who's the mastermind here, you know, clearly, clearly Audrey throws Lori under the bus during the testimony. Lori, Lori threatened her. Lori threatened to chop her up into pieces and brought up trash bags and told her she enjoyed watching someone take um, their last breath. But there's some other things that I think are really interesting in um, Audrey's testimony. And, and I want to play them now. Debbie, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate you, Debbie. And Michelle, thanks for reminding people. There are uh, over 4,000 people here with us tonight. And, and thank you for your likes and for sharing this video and for subscribing. It helps our work immensely. And you can also go join us at patreon.com slash hidden to crime as well. Thank you to everyone. So let me play some of um, Audrey Baratero's testimony. Uh, this is from our channel. Why don't I play it now? And John, feel free to wave and stop me. I'm going to be watching here because I actually can't even hear it. <laughs> so okay. um, I can follow along with the transcription, but I still don't know when to, to stop and pause. But there are some things I want to point out. And because I can't hear it, uh, some things I want to point out that I think are really important. Audrey, um, we learn why Audrey was even friends with Lori. It's because Chad told Audrey to be Lori's friend. We learn that Chad told Audrey that uh, he, 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 that Tammy was going to die and he was going to marry Lori. We learn that Chad is the one who, who could understand if someone was light or someone was dark. There's just some really interesting things here in um, Audrey's testimony. So here we go. At some point, did you have contact with him about his books? Yes. Um, about two months after I had seen him at that time in St. George in 2018, he reached out to me on Facebook um, to open up communication. And at that time, I asked him some questions I had about his books. Okay. So who initiated the contact? He did. And that was on... Facebook. Facebook, okay. Um, how would you communicate with him after that? On the phone. On the phone. Did you continue to communicate on Facebook or was it just on the phone? Just on the phone. Okay. And what kinds of things would you talk about with Chad? Religious things. Okay. Um, and you were continuing to talk with Lori? Yes, uh, about a month and a half or so after he started a conversation and then he asked me to be friends with her. Okay. Um, once you started talking with Lori, I think you said February 2019? Yes. What would you talk about with her? About like religious things or spiritual experiences. Okay. Do you recall uh, talking to Lori about her move to Rexburg? Yes. And do you know where Chad was living at the time? He was living in Rexburg. Uh, do you recall talking to Lori in late August or September 2019 about her daughter, Tylee? Yes, there was a few times in the fall that I asked her how her daughter was doing uh, when I stayed at her house in November 2018. I met her daughter for a few minutes. Okay. And so in the fall of 2019, 
um, I asked every once in a while, like, how is Tylee doing? Because she was at college. And towards the end of the friendship, um, when I asked her, how's she doing at BYU? She said that she doesn't talk to me very much these days. Okay. So I think you mentioned you had met Tylee initially at that uh, Arizona conference. Yes. Okay. Did you ever meet JJ? Yes, for about five minutes, yeah. Okay. Did you ever have the opportunity to meet Tammy Daydell? Yes, I did once. And how did that occur? Um, I happened to just be going to Idaho, and um, Tammy and Garth uh, and Chad wanted to go to dinner. And Garth was married to at the time that you met her. She was married to Chad. Did Chad ever say anything to you about Tammy? Yes. Uh, during the course of the friendship, he said that he had had a near-death experience years before and that he had been told by a deceased relative that Tammy would pass away before she turned 50. Do you recall when he told you this? I would say around the end of January 2019 or in February 2019. Okay. And at some point, did he indicate to you that he felt he would get married again? Yes, he did. Did he tell you who he would marry? He didn't tell me for a while, uh, but then eventually he said Lori. Okay. And did he discuss this with you prior to Tammy's death? Yes. What were your observations regarding that? What do you mean? What did you say to him? What did you? I asked that? him if he had talked to Tammy or and or his children about it. And he indicated that he had talked to Tammy for sure. And I don't remember about the children. Okay. Now, you mentioned when you talked on the phone with Chad and Laura, you talked about religious stuff, spiritual stuff. Did they talk about other spiritual or re religious teachings with you? Besides what we've already kind of covered. Yes. Did they talk to you about prior lives or probations that Lori and he had? Yes. What do you remember about that? He said that he had been Methuselah, and he said that he had been an apostle at the time of Jesus Christ, James. Okay. And do you recall if Lori and Chad indicated a belief that they had been married in previous lives? Yes. Do you know what names they claimed to have in that prior life? I don't remember about the time when he said he was Methuselah. I remember that she was somehow around, according to them at that time. But I remember that he said, he indicated that they'd been married at that time when he said that he was an apostle. And he said he was who? James. And do you recall who he said um, Lori was? His wife. And he said her name was El Elena. Elena or Elena? Elena. Um, at some point, did you move away from Utah? Yes, I did. Where did you move to? I moved to Missouri. Okay. Did Lori come and visit you in Missouri? She did. She and her niece, Melanie Boudreaux, said they didn't have anything else to do and asked if they could come and see the church historical sites in Missouri. They had never seen them. Okay. Do you remember when that was? October 2019. Do you remember if it was the first part of October or uh, later? The first part. Okay. And you mentioned that Melanie, her niece, was with her. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Was anyone else with her? No. Did you ever see Tylee with her in Missouri? I did not. Um, you mentioned that the reason for their visit was to see some of the church sites. Yes, they said that they had some free time and wanted to go see the church sites. They'd never seen them before. Um, did you visit with them at that time? I did. Where did you guys visit? We went to a place called Adam and Diamond and um, to the temple, and uh, they went to Liberty Jail. Okay. <clears throat> At some point, did you also go back to their hotel room? I did. 
Did you stay there with them? I did stay there one night, yes. Okay. Now I want to talk to you a little bit more about this experience that you had in the conference in the summer in the hotel room. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, the first time you'd heard about this idea of zombies and people being possessed. Is that right? Yes. And um, do you remember when you first heard Lori use the term zombie? I don't, but it would have been in the summertime. Okay. And do you know what it meant when she was explaining this if someone was a zombie? Yes. Um, the idea was that the person was possessed and that there was a spirit in them that needed to be taken out. Did you ever discuss with Lori or Chad whether someone was light or dark? Yes. Um, what did that mean? Chad, um, Chad had this idea that I guess like he would say if someone was light or dark depending on if like they were predominantly a good person or if he predominantly thought that they were a negative person. Okay. Did you discuss with Lori people that she believed were dark or were zombies? Yes. And who were those people? She said her husband Charles was and then um, Later, at the end of the friendship, she said that her children were. Anyone else? And Tammy. Okay. Yes. And so her children, can you just give me their names again? Tylee and JJ. So these included Charles, Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. Is yes. that right? Was there anyone else that she, she talked about being dark? Uh, yes. Um, Melanie Boudreaux, one or two of her children. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to when you visited with her and Lori at the hotel room in Missouri. Um, what happened there? They invited me to stay in their hotel room instead of driving back to my house, which was a distance away. And um, it was going great. And then um, basically she brought up the idea of working on Tammy. And again, when you say working on, what did you guys do? She said that Tammy had um, a spirit that was in her and needed to be taken out. And I told her I did not want to help and that I did not want to participate. And she... Okay, if you need to get some water. She highly pressured me saying, you're supposed to be my friend. You're supposed to help me. Like Chad asked you to be my friend. And I reiterated that I didn't want to. And she kept on. And this was later in the night. And I didn't know. I... I didn't do those things in my own life. And I said that I would say a prayer. And basically, I said a prayer to Heavenly Father saying, okay, I don't know what's going on. If there is something going on with Tammy and it needs to be taken out, I ask for thee to help her. For thy angels to help her. And I asked that she would be able to feel the love of God. And then did the prayer. Okay. And were you holding hands with Lori and Melanie during this no. circle? No. Okay. Um, do you remember what other people were doing besides you during this circle? They were standing or sitting. Okay. Did Lori say anything about what needed to happen to this spirit that was in Tammy? That it needed to be out. Okay. At that time, I'd never heard it before. It was, again, at the end of the friendship, because I dissolved the friendship. But 
basically at that time, Chad brought up an idea that, according to him, that if the spirit was in someone's body, that they were somehow being held prisoner. And like an idea of a cage or something, okay. like jail. And so the first time you participated in some... Okay. I mean, did you? I, I just want to point out, even that last one, it was it was Chad's right belief system, right? Isn't it clear? Yeah, it, Chad? I think it, it reinforces the discussion we had earlier that Lori clearly went along with it, but this is an ideology. This is not a person, and so I think if if Pryor's through line is that Lori is the person that's the common thread, then Pryor is not apparently paying attention to what's going on. Yes. Yes. Uh, some interesting things that Audrey stated. I just want to repeat once again, Chad is the one that told Audrey that Tammy was going to die. She right. even said, does Tammy know this? He said, yeah. Um, that he was going to marry somebody else. Chad is the one that explained past lives and told Audrey, who she was in a past life. Chad is the one that told Lori to trust Audrey. And Chad is the one that told Audrey to be friends with Lori. Chad is, Chad is quite the, the puppet master here. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's, that's always been our position that I think the proof of that is that if you remove this ideology, then none of this occurs. That you have you have a real strong sense of dehumanization going on. The Chad's system of light and dark and his designation of zombies creates this tremendous dehumanization of the of the, of the victims. And that in many ways allows these actions to occur. Yes. Thank you, babe. Dr. Babe, my love. All right. <laughs> Anything else you want to share tonight? Um, not really. I think we could, I could go down a few rabbit holes, but I noticed we're, we're almost at two hours, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, I think, I think I've covered pretty much what I want to cover. Yeah. I feel good about what I wanted to cover too. I do. Um, thank you. I think, uh, that, go ahead. Just, uh, I, I just have a thought on, you know, I've noticed some of the chat and, and people, you know, talking about how literal some of this is. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's interesting to think about the correlation between say ideology and violence. And I think that sometimes what happens is and this, I'm, this is a big topic. So I'm, I'm just going to scratch the surface here. But I think sometimes what happens is that when you, when you, somebody like Chad and Lori and this group, when you eliminate all other perceptions or interpretations of the world, I think you really, you create a situation where in some ways the only way out of that is through violence. You know, and I, I think part of the issue here is that Chad created a system of thought or an ideology that kind of backed him in a corner. And I, I think he had to prove himself to Lori. And I, I think that in some ways he may have felt like the only way through that was through violence. And I, I think that's true of a lot of ideology that, that when your interpretation gets challenged or when you see the world as only having maybe one interpretation so if you think of, of if you think of human beings as reading the world every day, like a book, that we all read the world and we all have we might have different interpretations and somehow we kind of can reach a common ground on our interpretations. But if you get to the point where you see one perception or one interpretation of the world, I think that's a problem. In the sense that the, you you shut down discussion, you shut down other points of view. You shut down other interpretations 
And, and sometimes the only way out of that is through violence. And violence in particular will prove your point. It'll prove your view of the world. And so I'm, I'm oversimplifying a really big topic, but I, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Uh, a friend of Audrey, Janelle, is sharing that she had a good heart. What Lori said about her serving is how her heart is, and I'm so sad that she saw her get entangled with this. Um, I'll share something uh, that uh, John Pryor told me at trial. <laughs> We spoke briefly. Trial uh, prior was there every day, um, which was interesting. You know, he's not paying to be there, right? Um, John Pryor was definitely wanting to know all about Lori's Lori's trial. Uh, so he let me well, know for good that, reason. Uh, for good reason, by the way, he's if he can look at some of the evidence in advance, he has he has a bit of an edge. Yeah. He, he, uh, so John Pryor told us we've been really hard on Chad. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he told you that I was particularly hard on Chad. Yes. And I, I just want to say this. Um, we, we source our work. We, we try to be reasonable people, although we sometimes share our, um, how appalled we are and angry we are, um, if we've been hard on Chad, John Pryor, it's because perhaps your client deserves it. <laughs> just gonna say well, that. I my comment would be, show me some evidence that points in another direction. I'm, I'm just trying to look at the evidence and make sense of it. And so I guess that's what exactly what he's going to do at trial. So I guess... I guess we'll... I'll, I'll wait and see what evidence they have that that shows that Lori was in charge of everything and Chad was framed or whatever, whatever he's going to argue. I don't, I don't, I can't imagine he would go that far, but my response is show me the evidence. Well said. I'll, I'll be, I'll be happy to change my perspective once I see sufficient evidence to point in a different direction or to, to challenge my perspective at this point. I'm completely open to doing that, but I have to, I have to see something that disputes it. Yes. Show us the evidence. Well said. Well said. And, you know, uh, John Pryor is working hard. He is filing motions right and left. And it is it, he has made it known that he is going to fight for his client and that he is going to present a defense. So I am looking forward to seeing what he brings forward. And, and I will be open to it, too. I think that's the one thing here at Hidden True Crime that we do is we remain open. Um, we we allow others to influence us in all the good ways. And uh, we'll go where the facts and the evidence lead us. So, all right. Anything else? I think that's about it for tonight. Mm -hmm. Many think you've been charitable towards Chad. And I actually want to say I agree with that too. I think you... Uh, show your empathy and uh, understanding towards most human beings on this, on this planet. So thank you. Well, it, it, my, my job is to maintain it, as much objectivity as I can, even with some of the worst criminals you can imagine. So I always want to give them the benefit of the doubt and try to write reports or conduct forensic evaluations that look at both sides so the more evidence I can look at, the better prepared I am to, to provide an opinion or to weigh in on a case. And um, my goal is to, if, as best I can, to represent all perspectives as fairly as I can. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your super chats tonight. Thank you for your support. Thank you for those who choose to uh, join uh, with a YouTube membership or Patreon account after this. And as always, uh, two things you can do that are um, just completely free and mean so much are to subscribe to our channel, 
to like or give this video a thumbs up if you appreciated it and to, and to share our channel with your friends. Thank you so much and have a good night. Good night.